So they were supposed to have me at 11 o'clock. And then they told Mark, we're finished for the day. And left. So when I came here at 11, they all went home because they thought they had no math class. Yeah. I don't know why they thought that. Well, I have been in yes, Abdo. Yeah. 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 Yes, why do you think that? My business students never showed up at 11 o'clock. For some reason they thought they were free. So it meant I actually didn't have to stay in this room. So I went out for lunch. But um, I don't know why they thought. I'm trying to figure out why they thought they had no math. Oh yeah, so Mark them all absent. Because they got a timetable that says they have me at 11. But after Mark's class, he just went home. All of them? Well, there was only four of them in, so... How many now? Uh, normally about 10 or something. 10. Huh? I don't know. I, I can't always understand what people think. Anyways, we're here, and we'll continue with the atoms. So we're getting closer to the end of atoms. Um, we already finished another lesson. Now we are on to... Yes, this one. Uh, I think I'm missing a couple of definitions in this, which I may have to get from the internet. But uh, Yeah, my other browser stopped working. Which is a bit of a pain. Right, yo. Sandwich for breakfast and lunch. It's a desert. <coughs> Mushari food. It's a desert. It's a desert? Yeah. What's a desert? Dessert. Oh, it's oh, dessert as well. Oh, it's not a sandwich, okay. Dessert sandwich. All right, fission and fusion, please. That better be English, Mushari. your name for a second there, it's been so long since I saw you. I'm not joking, come on. <laughs> yep, that is true, that's true, that is true. Uh, okay, have you got that now? Come on, fission and fusion. Right, so, um, let's have a look here. This, you see, I don't have the def. Oh no, I do have the definition. Great. Uh, this is what's called fission. There's two types of nuclear reactions here: fission and fusion. Uh, and actually, we've seen the formula for this in the previous lesson. This is when one neutron combines with uranium, and the uranium splits. Do you remember into krypton, uh, baryon, and three neutrons? We had that formula in the last class. You remember? Today, yeah. Today, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes. So, this released energy. We actually calculated how much energy uh, was released, and we worked out that a small village, a small town of about a thousand, uh, ten thousand people, uh, would require about a gram of uranium per hour. So, a lot of energy is released in this fission process. So, why is this called fission? So what happens is the neutron fires at the uranium and breaks it into two new elements. So there's no more uranium. The uranium has become uh, krypton and barium, and then three neutrons broke off as well. How do they Oh, we'll get to that as well too, yeah. So the neutron collides with the uh, uranium and uh, breaks into two. This is the concept of fission. fission is a nuclear process when an atom splits apart into smaller atoms and a lot of energy is released 
and this is used in nuclear weapons and not just weapons but nuclear reactors which are the power plants so you know it's used as both a weapon but also for creating energy as well a uh, definition you could need for the exam nuclear fission let me just uh, open up the text bar So the key is that the atom splits. You know this for Mushiri? Yes. <coughs> and we've calculated the energy release. Now, um, you notice in the reaction I gave you a moment ago, three neutrons are released. Uh, this is common for this type of process. When the atom splits into two or more, neutrons also break off. That's actually really useful because if you see in this picture here, a neutron is fired at this atom. This atom then breaks into two other atoms, but uh, neutrons are released. The released neutrons uh, collide into neighboring atoms, and those atoms also break and release neutrons. So what's happening here is something we call a chain reaction, where one event causes another event causes another event. So the way you should picture it is um, the uranium releases neutrons which collide into other uranium atoms which also release neutrons and so on and so on and so on. Uh, but this is where you have to be careful. So for example, we could have one neutron hits into uranium, becomes two other elements, and how many more neutrons are released? Uh, in the example earlier, it was three neutrons, which then colli could collide into three more uranium atoms. And then what happens to these uranium atoms? They break into smaller atoms, and also what is released? Three more neutrons. And what could happen with those neutrons? They could also collide. So let's imagine uh, when the atom breaks here, into two, it releases some energy, we'll call that energy E, although we calculated what it was earlier, I don't remember what it was, whatever, 10 to the minus 11. So when this collision takes place, we have E, but when these three break, we have 3E, but when these nine break, we have 9E. So do you see how quickly the energy is growing? Do you remember the name of this sequence? 1 plus 3 plus 9 plus 27. It has a name though. Geometric. Geometric. GP. GP, yeah. So, GP. So, this actually, um, if you remember the formula, it's something like 1 over 1 minus 4, uh, which in this case is uh, 3. 
well, I suppose, sorry, it's 1 minus r n over 1 minus r, yeah. So that would be minus 2, minus, minus makes that, so that would be e, the 2 is at the bottom, so that's a half times 3n minus 1. So very, very roughly, just if you want a very rough estimate, it's um, 3 power n times e. Of course, there's other terms in it. So the point I'm trying to make is, uh, after one process, you have 3e. E. After two, you have nine, and so on and so on. It grows very quickly. So quick, in fact, this is what you will get when you have a nuclear bomb, a nuclear explosion. You have a chain reaction. You have a small bit of uranium, and it very, very quickly expands, and all the uranium in it has been destroyed and has become energy. So a chain reaction is a reaction in which the heavy isotope, like uranium, splits into smaller isotopes and neutrons are released. And these released neutrons hit more heavy atoms, which as a result hit another and another and another. And then the chain reaction is the main way of getting nuclear energy, uh, like a nuclear bomb. If you don't have enough uranium, then you don't get a chain reaction. So like what happens here, let's imagine there's a uranium here, here, and here. And we fire a neutron here, and it splits. But nothing else happens, because the released neutrons don't hit any neighbors. But if you have enough uranium atoms, when it splits into three, then they can split again. So the critical mass is the amount you need so that the chain reaction can happen. If you don't have it, the chain reaction won't happen. If it's less than the critical mass, not enough. If it's greater than the critical mass, then there are enough uh, for the chain reaction to take place. So there's a lot here to write down, but you do need to write it all down, I'm afraid. Yes, go for it. Be strong. Be brave. Finish the ad?
How did the book person discover it? Um, I think it might have been like we were talking about earlier, Watson and Croft, but it's interesting because this would have been discovered first mathematically before experimentally. So it was Einstein's theory that predicted the release of energy through a process like this. So it was actually discovered theoretically first, was the first thing. And then it wasn't really successfully done uh, until World War II in the Manhattan Project where they tried to make a, a chain reaction in a bomb, of course, uh, which you know uh, was uh, used on Japan at the end of World War II. So the first discovery would have been theoretical, the first use of this would have been World War II. Then after that, the next use of it would have been uh, for nuclear power plants. But it wasn't really something discovered in a lab, if that makes sense. Do you know what I mean? It was predicted mathematically, and then afterwards, Maybe. just made it just. Well, that's not true. I said it was first used in Japan, but I suppose they would have tested it in, um, oh, what? Can't remember, some island in America where they did all the nuclear testing. Or maybe it was in the desert, Nevada. Yeah, I think it was the Nevada desert where they first tested these. I think so. so you're looking at 1940s, around about this time. Okay, have you got this here? Yeah. Great. Mushiri? No. Mayor? Okay. No? No? no. Mayor? No. Great, great. So I know there's an awful lot there. Uh, this lesson is heavy on the definition. So critical mass, you want it to be more than that for a chain reaction, less than that, no chain reaction. Uh, let me just add in a couple of... Uh, Spaces here. Hang in there, Riyad. Not much longer to go. Okay. Now, how can we use this in a good way? Of course, we all know from TV and movies the negative way to use these for weapons, but they can be used to make power. This diagram you will have to recreate in the exam if they ask it. It's unlikely that they will ask you to draw a nuclear reactor, but what is possible is that they might provide you with a diagram and uh, uh, have a part missing from the picture where you have to write the name in or you know something like that. Now, I know there's a lot here, but really the one that they would focus on in the exam is this part of the reactor, which is where the interesting stuff happens. So let's have an outline of how this reactor works. It's uh, not actually, I know it looks complicated, but it's actually surprisingly simple. So what you have, um, you have a um, cold water supply. This is usually like a river or an ocean, uh, but this cold water comes in some pipes and goes back out. Uh, and then at the bottom of this tank you have some water. This water doesn't come in or go out, it stays in the system. Okay. So this water firstly is pumped into this chamber where it gets really hot from these pipes. Now why do these pipes get really hot? Well, what's happening right here, you have this material called uranium fuel element or uh, uranium rod. 
So what is a uranium rod? A uranium rod is just a, a, a long pipe made out of uranium. Now it's not made out of pure uranium. I think it's mixed in with other materials. But what happens with this uranium is, you know, it releases radiation. This is basic. Uh, it releases alpha and beta radiation. So these uranium rods, they're releasing a lot of radiation. So what happens when they release radiation? Well, this chamber gets really hot from all the radiation coming off from them. Uh, so usually there's something in here like, um, here it says sodium, but I think you could use other things too. So this sodium in here gets really, really hot from all the radiation. The sodium is then pumped around this pipe. So this pipe is really, really hot. It's full of really hot sodium. So the water, what will happen to the water? What will happen if it gets really, really hot? It becomes steam. So then the steam rises through here and then pushes a giant generator, something which you learned about in fields. So you know if you have your um, uh, conductor and the conductor is rotating in the magnetic field, what happens? It produces a current. So then you get the electricity here. So the water passes through the generator and when it comes out here it cools back down because it hits the cold pipe. So when the hot steam hits the cold pipe it turns back to water at the bottom. But what happens to this cold water when the steam hits the pipe? It becomes hot water. So the hot water comes out here. So actually if you live near a power plant, a nuclear power plant, you get free hot water. This is one advantage because the process releases hot water. So all the homes in the town, completely free hot water because the hot water is made as a uh, byproduct of the reactor. So um, how can you increase or decrease the energy? We have these things um, called moderators which is not marked in the diagram and then control rods. So the control rod moves up and down the moderator. So what the heck's the moderator? The moderator is something made out of carbon and this carbon absorbs the radiation from the uranium rods and prevents too much reaction taking place. So it's almost like um, a sponge or a barrier. So what happens here is You have your uranium, and the uranium is releasing alpha, beta, and gamma radiation, but it's also releasing neutrons. And what happens when the neutrons hit uh, uranium? It splits and makes more, yeah. So if you put a big piece of carbon in between the rods, you reduce the amount of reactions that take place because you're blocking some of the neutrons. And if you want more energy and more reactions, what do you do to this carbon? Well, you just lift it. So, for example, this is at 0%. If you raise it to half the height, then you would have 50%. So you can literally just move the rod up and down to change the amount of energy. So when you see on the news the disasters that happen in the nuclear power plants, what usually happens? What usually happens you have your uranium rods and you have the carbon and on top of the carbon you have something called a control rod so you just push this up and down to move the carbon rod up or down seems simple uh, but what happens sometimes is this breaks so then when you try to push it down you can't and this is uh, locked so then what happens well you get lots of radiation here more and more, it gets hotter, it gets hotter, it gets hotter, and then kaboom. That's what happens. But why doesn't it, like when it hits the carbon, doesn't it go back? No, actually, so the carbon absorbs the neutron, and the neutron's not released. Sorry, so I know I, uh, the way I drew it, it looked like it was bouncing off. But really what happens is the neutron then is uh, absorbed by the carbon. Um, so, imagine now you're in the situation where the control rod is up and the carbon is up and the rod is stuck and this is getting hotter and hotter and hotter. What do you do then? Well, that's, yeah. yeah. But to try and stop it, what could you do? 
It's what they usually do. Oh, yeah. Uh, this here, you're usually connected to some water supply like an ocean or a river. So in the worst case situation, there's actually uh, vents here which are connected to the ocean or the river. And when this is overheating, the vents open up and the chamber, the reactor, fills up with ocean water. And the cold water comes in and then comes out. And this is to try and cool everything down. If you can cool, yeah? It just continues to heat up. Now, what usually happens is, after a couple of days of the cold water running through it, it's cool enough that people can go in and put up temporary carbon barriers to stop the reaction. And then, once that has happened, you can then, uh, you know, fix the situation. Uh, so there is a risk using this process because if the carbon jams, then it just will heat up until uh, it will explode. So this is, of course, what you don't want to happen, and this is why it's important to keep it cool. Then. So in the exam, they really like to ask the students what the moderator is, which I think I do not Where have. They one uranium. Your one uranium rod doesn't give you much. You need to have a couple of them side by side so that they can kind of interact and release more energy. Three, yeah, whatever, six, twelve. You just have them stacked up like... Um, you know, you'd have one here, and you'd have another one here, and there's stuff, neutrons firing between the two of them to, you know, get more energy. And if you have too much energy, you can just put the carbon barrier down some of the way to try and slow it down. Yeah, you get the idea here? Yeah. Uh, so, do your very best to draw this in your notebook. Uh, what's missing on the diagram, which annoys me, I have to add it in because it's not in this. Is this it's called a control rod, but what's at the bottom of the control rod is something called a moderator, which is usually uh, some carbon. Lucia Reef, what are you doing? You've been looking at your phone now for five minutes. You're not interested in this? Uh, Unfortunately, it's on your exam, so you need to be at least a little interested. Can you draw this, please? Why so sleepy, Mayor? You're struggling to stay awake. Late night? Yeah. What time? Yeah. Oh, dude. Why were you up until four? Because I can't sleep. Why can't you sleep? Too much coffee? Yeah. Too much studying. Making it beautiful.
I have an email from the business students. Yeah, you see, I said like two weeks ago when they asked would there be classes this week, I said I usually don't do classes. I guess I didn't stress the word usually strong enough. So when they saw my name on the timetable, they didn't think, oh, we have classes. They thought, hmm, we said we don't, so no need to check. Did you draw a beautiful picture? Yeah. Show me. How beautiful. Wow. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, go on. It's not even a square. <laughs> Careful now. Did you draw this now? Yeah. Great. He yeah. had? Great. Now, um, I just want to add to the picture. So you can add this to your picture. Let me just edit it in here. Open it up with good old paint. Okay, has that opened yet? No. No, it has. So on your diagram, if you can just add to here, do my very best to. Don't like this reactor core here. Let me just move that out of the way. If you can just add here, moderator. This reactor core, uh, Iad, the reactor core is like the whole thing. Um, the moderator is the part at the end here that's usually made of carbon that blocks the neutrons. So if you can just mark that in on your diagram. Uh, very important um, for the exam because they love asking about the moderator. This whole thing is the reactor core, so how can I kind of indicate that? Uh, oh, ugly. Oh. Maybe I'll just put it hovering over it. Yeah, I guess we'll have to do. Okay, did you add in moderator? Super. Right, continue with that. So nuclear fuel is a material that can be burnt by fission or fusion. Usually the fuel for the reactor is something like uh, uranium-235, 
or plutonium. These are typical uh, uh, nuclear fuels to use in reactors. Uh, the action of mining, refining, purifying, using and disposing of nuclear fuel is called the fuel cycle. So of course, uh, where does uranium come from? It doesn't just appear. Where, where would you find uranium? Do you know where? Like what country or where? Russia. Hmm? Russia. Where? Russia. Russia. Yeah. Yes, I think so. Although I think a big country is Australia. So I think Australia has many mines which you can mine for things like uranium. So uranium exists in the earth uh, in uh, mines. So of course it's not pure. You're going to have to mine it and then you're going to have to refine it and then take out the uranium from the rocks and then you have to use it but then when you finish using it you don't just throw it away it's radioactive so you have to dispose of it carefully so um, what would maybe you know this but in France what do they do to dispose of the uranium I don't know if you know this uh, that would not be France, correct. But you're not too far off what they do in France. So in France they put it in containers, but bury it on the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. Now I don't know if they still continue to do that because they recently discovered that these containers that they buried 30 years ago are starting to crack mm -hmm. and leak. Not great. Mm -hmm. South Africa is the largest producer. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. Amazing, I didn't know this, I thought it was Australia. Um, Canada, was the largest. Canada was the largest, yes, I knew Canada was big. What is the Pakistan. Kazakhstan. Huh? Kazakhstan. Oh, Kazakhstan. Yeah, no, I know Kazakhstan, I didn't know they produced uranium. Okay. All right, interesting. So, uh, that's what they do in France. Um, do you know what they do in the UK? They have a special facility in Sellafield in the UK where they treat it and then release it into the ocean. So they go through a process to make it less radioactive and then they release it in the ocean. This is a big problem in Ireland because they built this plant on their west coast, which means their nuclear waste makes it to our east coast, northeast coast. So if you walk along the northeast coast of Ireland, uh, you will find that the coast is slightly radioactive from the plant in the UK. So it's interesting that they decided to build the plant in such a way that the waste would flow to their neighbour rather than dealing with it themselves. <laughs> they love their neighbours. They love their neighbours, don't they? They sure do. Uh, so the big problem with nuclear, I was saying earlier, was quite oh, expensive. I don't know actually. I don't know. Um, I'll have to look it up. I don't know what they do, uh, but it is a very long process where they can treat it uh, and make it mm, less damaging to the environment. But it's still radioactive, so uh, maybe it's, I don't know, better, but not great. Anyway, I was saying earlier that nuclear is very expensive. This is part of the cost. Part of the cost is when you're finished with the fuel, you can't, you know, you have to do something with it, you know. Uh, so usually what happens is a lot of nuclear power plants, they get made, they run, they run for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and then they have to be dismantled. And then all of a sudden the power company says, oh, we have no money to dismantle <laughs> it. It's very expensive to dismantle it. And so then the government has to pay, which means the people have to pay. <coughs> so it might seem cheap at the beginning, but in total the cost is actually quite high. So why do they support of what? The uranium stuff. Oh the uranium fuel only burns for so long and then you don't get much energy out of it. You know, it's Not like much. Yeah, you maybe only get like one percent of what you got at the beginning. Mm. So it's no good to use, but you can't just get rid of it because it's still radioactive, you know, so what do you do with it? So nuclear fission is expensive and it's dangerous and really in my opinion it's 
probably not worth it. It's only really worth it if you want to be energy independent, which means that you have a government that doesn't want to import oil from the Middle East, like France or whatever, uh, or maybe like America or something. Uh, France, I don't believe, have any natural <coughs> fossil fuels. I don't think so. I don't think so. They have no, they have no gas or oil. I don't think they have oil. Japan's a great example of when nuclear would be suitable. Uh, nuclear power is very suitable in Japan because Japan has very little natural resources. Very, very little. You know, Japan... How do they grow them? Uh, I don't know what they do in Japan. I would have a feeling, though, they probably bury it like they do in France. Because uh, that part of the world, there's lots of tension with your neighbours. So it might not be good to have a plant like what they do in the UK. Mm -hmm. Their neighbours might not be as forgiven as we are. You know. So um, it's worth noting that it's uranium-235 and plutonium-239 is what they use in the power plants. are you doing? Latte art. Latte art. Nice. Did you make note of what I said to make note of? No. What did I say to make note of? Not all of this. <laughs> yes, write that down please. You had a little sleep? They won't ask you to pay at the end like a taxi. <laughs> Why are you planning on using an ambulance? Be quicker than driving. Yeah. Okay, did you write that down? Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yep, yeah. you made note of that? Yeah, okay. So, next now, uh, we talked about moderator, so let's get the formal definition of a moderator. In nuclear engineering, a neutron moderator, or moderator for short, is a material uh, that reduces the speed of the neutrons, thereby turning them into thermal neutrons capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction involving uranium or similar fissile nuclides. So there's a lot of technical language here, uh, but basically a moderator slows down the neutrons, making the chain reaction more manageable. You really don't want the chain reaction to happen too much because then kaboom, big problem. So they, they kind of act like a speed bump. You know, to keep the process going at the right speed. Um, what would you need for the exam? I suppose actually it's enough to have even just reduced the speed of fast neutrons for the exam. That would be enough. Let me just um, save my picture I was working on. Uh, so for the exam, you could go with um, yeah. I'd say if you for the exam, you would need the first bit, but I'd like you to write it all down. But in the exam, uh, the first half of the sentence would be enough. What the heck is that?
Got it this? Wow, look who's returned. I thought we lost you. You have this? Yes. Mayor? Yes. Continue? Yes. Yes. Yeah, continue. Okay. Uh, control rods, which we also saw in the diagram, are used to control the fission rate of uranium and plutonium. <coughs> uh, they're composed of chemical elements such as boron, silver, er, indium, cadmium, and they're capable of absorbing many neutrons without fission in themselves. Um, so the control rods, um, basically, again, just like the moderator, except uh, they are much more able to uh, absorb. These materials, boron, can really absorb. Uh, moderators, um, mo if you want to think about it like this, moderators are like speed bumps. <laughs> control rods are like stop signs or walls. So uh, the moderator will absorb the neutrons and slow them down. Uh, the control rods, if you pull it down over the fuel, uh, will completely block the neutrons and just absorb them all. Uh, so this is when you have an emergency, you drop the control rod and block the neutrons from continuing. Uh, the moderator is, you know, just like I said, a speed bump. Um, let me have a look at my picture there. Yeah. Okay. Not a great picture. Uh, so you've got two parts. You've got the control rod and the moderator. Control rods. Uh, controlled, yes, but more precisely, it could stop it. Whereas the moderator can only really slow it down. Uh, we considered it at one time, but too many people were unhappy with this idea. I would agree with them. I do not believe we could do it safely here. We don't have the same skill in experience, like in the UK or France. You know, I just wouldn't trust the government to do it correctly. And Ireland's such a small country, you know. Indeed. If there was a yeah. problem, that's the end of Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a small island, you know. No one wants to. No one wants to. Yeah. Okay, you got this? Yes? Okay. Um, let me just actually. Right. Okay. Now, have I got the definition here? I do. Now, uh, next part. So, so far we've seen fission, and there's actually two lessons, to, or two topics, say fission and fusion. So, just to recap where we are globally, all the nuclear power plants in the world use this. Uh, type of system called nuclear fission 
where you have the diagram earlier about the splitting of the uranium, the uranium heats up, it heats the water, and so on and so on. But of course you all know the dangers of this. If the chain reaction moves too fast and you cannot stop it, then it will heat up and explode. And you've seen this in the news, you've seen it happen in Japan recently. Uh, before that it happened uh, in Chernobyl. Uh, I also think it happened in the, U in the US as well a long time ago. So every few years you do see it happening where uh, the chain reaction increases too much and you have a disaster. And it's usually because of the control. And it's usually, I think in all cases it's because the control rod jams and is unable to drop down over the fuel. Uh, I know that's what happened in Chernobyl. Although actually no, in Japan um, it was to relate it to an earthquake, wasn't it? A tsunami. Oh, a tsunami, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, in Chernobyl I believe it was the same thing as well of the control rod. So it, no, it's usually the control rod anyways. But there is a new type, or not new, well, new in that it's the future, which I think is really, uh, when you say what will be the energy of the future, it's not going to be oil, it's not going to be coal, it's not, I don't even think it will be green energy like solar and uh, you know, wind and all that. This is what the new uh, energy of the future will look like. It's called nuclear fusion. Uh, here is an example here of what's happening. Uh, you have here uh, deuterium. Deuterium is just the name for hydrogen <coughs> 2. And here, um, tritanium is <coughs> hydrogen 3. You take some H2, you take some H3, for example, and you fuse it together. So you have H2, H3, and jam it together. And what do you get at the end? You get a helium, which has how many protons? Two. How many beforehand? Uh, two in total. How many neutrons? Two and here there were three, so one of the neutrons has been freed. But the mass here and here is less than the mass here and here, so what's happened? Some of the mass has changed into energy. Why is it that much of energy? Why, yeah, why, huh? Why is it that much of energy? Um, the mass gets converted into energy. It's tiny, but from Einstein's formula, E equals mc squared, the C is so big, it means even a small mass can make a lot of energy. Yeah. Now, you might be, uh, have a look at this. What is different here compared to the one we did at the start of the class? So do you remember the one at the start of the class, what was happening? Neutron, Neutron hits, hits what? Uranium. uranium and the uranium split. Yeah. Now what's happening here is it's the opposite, isn't it? Yeah. You combine uh, two elements to make a new element and release energy. Why is this much safer? Well, there's no chain reaction. If you want this to stop, you just turn the machine off. It's completely in your control. There's no chain reaction. Um, in the first example, the process is able to feed itself. Mm. Naturally. And then yes, itself. naturally. But here, it is up to you to keep smashing the two together. And if you simply want to stop, then you stop smashing the two together. You turn one of the machines off. So it is 100% safe. Also, 100% clean. Because what do you get at the end? Do you have any radioactive material at the end? No. What do you have? Mm. Helium. Just helium. Helium like in the balloons. Completely clean. And what did you have at the start? Hydrogen. Not uranium. Completely clean. This is the energy of the future. But what is the problem? <coughs> it is extremely, extremely difficult to continuously fuse and smash the two together. It is a process that is so difficult to maintain continuously. It's so easy for it to break and stop. In the very beginning, this process only lasted for uh, one quarter of a second and then the machine stopped. Today, I believe the current record is uh, 12 hours. 
this is no good to power a city because you can't have it stopping every 12 hours. Yeah? But one day, in time, it will improve so that the machine runs maybe for one year, then maybe it runs for five years. And then at that point, I think people will say, okay, now it's time to use it. You know? um, so this is nuclear fusion, and it's the process of making a single heavy nucleus from two lighter nuclei and this, is uh, this process of nu nuclear reaction and also it releases a large amount of energy. So you have two small uh, atoms, smash it together to make a bigger atom and you release some energy in the process. One disadvantage, in the previous method all you have to do was fire a neutron. In this method you have to fire two atoms at each other. This requires uh, a lot of energy. So, oh yeah, we'll have a look at how that's done actually. Um, so, in the fusion here, before you write that down, I'd say, I think it's roughly, uh, for every one joule of energy you spend firing the two uh, hydrogens at each other, hydrogen one, uh, sorry, hydrogen two and hydrogen three, for every one joule of energy you spend to make the helium, you get uh, 10 joules back. I mean, that's still good, but believe it or not, that's not as good as, say, oil. So, with oil, where's oil? Of course, it's in the ground. So, for every, uh, in Saudi as well, yeah, for every, uh, for every one joule that you spend uh, getting the oil out of the ground, because, you know, you have to work to get the oil out, uh, you get in total about 25, maybe 30 joules <laughs> of energy. Back 100 years ago, when oil was easier to get, it was as high as 100 joules. You know, back 100 years ago, uh, some of the oil was so near the surface that if you break into the right spot, the oil uh, rushes out that never happens anymore because all the oil right now is so deep because all the cheap oil has been extracted. Uh, so even 1 to 10 sounds good but it's actually not that good when you compare it to alternatives like oil and gas. Okay, so if we can write this down and then we'll see how to fuse them together. You have this already now? Yeah. Yep. So, to the best of my knowledge, there is an experimental fusion power plant. I believe it's in Japan, although it's a joint project between Japan, the EU, and the US. And this is a, a prototype. They're trying to make a fusion power plant. If it succeeds, and they can get it working, then this would be the energy of the future. Because if you think about it, um, it's exactly what you want. It's clean, there's no waste, it's not dangerous, it, there's no risk of an explosion, and uh, it makes uh, energy, which then you could use this energy in electric cars. You know, so this, if this works, it would really solve uh, the need to have fossil fuels and, uh, you know, it could really just totally change the way we do things. Um, so you were asking how do you actually smash them together? 
So it's actually very, very interesting what you do. Can I draw that now? Okay. So, um, firstly, hydrogen 2 is two protons and zero... Oh no, sorry, what am I saying? Ridiculous. One proton and one neutron. And hydrogen 3 is one proton and two neutrons. No electrons. So what is the charge of hydrogen 2? Yeah, it's positive uh, 1, isn't it? And this one is uh, also positive 1. So it has a positive charge. Now, hydrogen at room temperature, what form is it in? Solid, liquid or gas? Yes. Gas, yeah. So let's imagine we have some mixture of hydrogen 2 and hydrogen 3 gas. It's just mixed together here. Come here. Please. Thank you. Uh, what charge is it? Positive. Yeah. Yep. So do you remember um, when we did fields, we said if we have a current, which is a moving charge, what do we get around it? A magnetic field. Mm -hmm. So we get this magnetic field around it. So what they do is we have this hydrogen gas and you have like a big um, <coughs> magnetic field around it or something like this, I don't know. And then of course the south or whatever. So this big magnetic field, what you do is you try and focus the gas into a ball shape. Do you understand? Because it has a charge and the gas is moving, obviously, because it's not a solid. So because it's moving, it has a magnetic field. Because it has a magnetic field, you can control it with another magnetic field. So then what you do is you try and get the gas in a sphere shape. H2, H3 gas. And this gas is held into place with a magnet, which is pretty cool. Because if you picture this room, what you have is a big round room. And at the edge of the room are magnets. And in the center of the room, what do you see? This tiny little ball of gas just floating there. You got that pictured so far? Yeah. So you're in this big room here. <coughs> Whoa. Then around the edge of the room, you have these little lasers. And these lasers fire at the gas. So, what's going to happen to this gas as you fire lasers at it? Heat. Heats up. What happens when a gas heats up? Move faster. The, the atoms move faster. If the atoms move fast enough, and when they hit into each other, what would happen? what we just saw in the picture, mm -hmm. the, the fusion. So if you can get it hot enough, the hydrogen 2 and the hydrogen 3 will fuse together and then the hydrogen becomes helium. And it gets really hot and then what happens? It releases energy. So although you're putting energy into it, let's say one, I don't know, gigajoule, whatever, the energy that you get off as heat will be bigger than that, it'll be 10 times that, 10 gigajoules. How do you absorb them? Good question. How do you absorb it? So then what you do is uh, you fill this room with another gas like lithium. The lithium fills this room up and the lithium will get hot. The lithium um, acts like a, like a sponge. It takes in the heat, but because it's much bigger, uh, the heat is kind of spread out. You know what I mean? Like It's kind of like you have this very small, hot circle and then this big area that warms up. Then what you do, you take a pipe, pipe goes in through the lithium around and back out and the water goes in. The water goes in cold, passes through the lithium, heats up and comes out as steam and then you know what to do then. The steam pushes a generator around. So the lithium is not going to mix with the heat? No, um, I don't know if they have some barrier between the two, but what you could do, if the lithium has a positive charge, then it will repel from the hydrogen in the center, which is also positive charge. So I suspect the lithium may be just positively charged and it will push away from the, uh, the uh, 
the hydrogen gas in the centre. So this gas is hydrogen and then it turns into helium. So it's a mixture of hydrogen and helium. Now does that sound familiar? You have a round ball of gas that's a mixture of hydrogen and helium and it's releasing a lot of energy in the form of heat. Does that sound familiar? Where have you seen that before? A helium hydrogen ball of gas that releases a lot of heat. Yes, correct. So you are literally making a miniature sun. Literally, that's what it is. Why doesn't uh, helium repel itself because it's so cold? The helium? Yeah. Why doesn't it repel? It wants to. It wants to. That's why you need the magnetic right. field to keep it in place. Now, there is no magnetic field around the sun to keep it in place. So what is the process that keeps the gas together and stops it from spreading out? Gravity. gravity, yeah. So the sun is big enough that the gravity can pull everything back in and prevent it from escaping. So this is what I mean, this is the energy of the future. This is, uh, you're making a miniature sun, and that's not an exaggeration, that's literally what you're doing. Uh, now, <coughs> if, if the gas broke, it's no longer a ball shape, then this is when the machine fails, because you need to keep it concentrated in the centre. So the difficulty is controlling the magnets to keep the gas in place because like you said the gas is trying to spread out because it's positively charged. So the helium, the hydrogen 2 and the hydrogen 3, they want to uh, separate. So you're trying to keep it really, really tightly packed in the centre, a difficult thing to do. But like I said, it's safe. So when you want to stop it, you just turn the laser off and then it just cools down and then it spreads back around the room. <coughs> so this, uh, this is the future. So maybe in 50 years time this will just become a normal thing. You know, every country has a couple of them. How long do they take to make it from quarter to Oh yeah, so what's the rate of progress? Um, when I was in school, your age, uh, my physics book said the record has been two seconds. Uh, that would be, let me think, when I was in class. So it's gone from about two seconds to 12 hours over maybe about 14 years. So maybe in another 15 years they could get it running for maybe a few weeks or a few days or whatever. So I would say in about 20 years it could they could prove that it's a possible way to generate energy and then maybe in another 20 years or 40 years you could start seeing them being used commercially in countries and then maybe in 50 years it just starts becoming a more normal thing to have in a country. It'd be a great thing to do on your presentation but it's probably too late now, you probably have all chosen your topics. Yeah. What's yours? Waves? Hybrid? Am I changing the disc? I think this is interesting stuff. Electricity. Electricity, oh yeah. That's right. Yeah, mine is also electricity. Okay, okay, yeah. Can I put this in the electricity if they do so you can also put this in? It's a, yeah, it's a, this would be, uh, in your presentation, if you had a section on future, the future of electricity, uh, this, yeah, this would be a clean way to generate electricity. Uh, it generates electricity. Also, it generates what else? Remember, hot water. Hot water. Also, uh, not as much hot water though. Also, it generates helium, so you can have free balloons or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <coughs> maybe not. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's much better. <laughs> All right, what we'll do is, I think we'll just do an exam question uh, for the last little bit here. Yeah. But there's no questions on this, it's all just theory. Uh, yeah, now just so you know, for the exam, if you want to mark it, the most common definition they ask for in the exam... No, moderator. Uh, they do ask for this, but the most common is moderator. Can you please mark that definition as being important for the exam? Hang in there, Mushari.
Um, dreaming about nuclear power? Dreaming about home. Dreaming about home. Let's have a look at another exam question here for Atom. So, we're getting quite close to the end now. What's the last two, two lessons? Yes, only two lessons left. What's wrong? Yeah. What? Okay. <laughs> what? You're excited? And because there's a match today, and I said to him, "Master, he said yes." I heard that like you are also in the same thing. Who's playing? <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Yeah. Oh. Mechanics, materials, electricity, waves. Right, here's a great one. We'll do this one. Um, let's start with the A part. So, very, very short. In fact, we could even do it together. Right, part. A1. What does the A represent here? Yeah, which is what, though? The number of protons. Yeah, number of protons and neutrons, correct. What does the Z represent? Yeah, which is what? Tell them what it is. What is it? number of neutrons. Oh, dude. Protons. Come on now. Who's your chemistry teacher? No, no, no. She'll hit you now if she hears you saying that. Protons. Protons. And what is an isotope? Uh, having the same chemical properties but different same number of protons. Same different, number number of protons. different number of neutrons. Uh, so in your explanation, is there any difference in the A and the Z? Yes. Uh, usually the A is twice as big as the Z. Usually. But if you have an isotope, often what is the relationship between A and Z? Uh, one of two and one. Two of two and one. Yeah, so it's more than twice the Z, typically, yeah? Uh, right, so how many marks for basic chemistry, physics knowledge? You know, that's four marks, so you're up to a good start, yes? Right, now, next one. Um, this is undergoing a decay, and you have to balance this equation. So you have to figure out uh, what is here. Is it alpha or beta? Um, so can you just write this down balanced, please? Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, Can you see that there's two question marks you need to fill in? Yeah. yeah. So if you can write that down, balance it, please. You start off with, let me write it here, 198.79. What's AU? Aluminium? No. No, it's not. Uh, Mercury? HG? HG Mercury. Yeah. Alright, so I'll give you one minute. I want you to balance this. Gold, of course. Yeah, gold. Do I want to balance? Yeah. Oh, good man. Yeah. You're right. Let's see. Give me. Give me. I didn't wrote that. Oh, goodness. Oh, they wrote that. Missing number. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Yes. Yeah. The numbers are correct. <laughs> All right. What number goes here? Uh, or what number goes here actually? One. No? Nearly. Has to be minus one because you want 79. Yeah. Uh, so this must be the beta. Uh, so here is Two. Uh, zero. Two. And this one here? One nine. One nine. Eight. Eight. How did you do this? I didn't understand. 
It's possibly because you missed this lesson. <laughs> I wasn't listening. Yeah. 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 Were you? In the morning I was. Hey, no, because you've been missing the last two weeks, except for yesterday's class and Thursday <coughs> two weeks ago. So I'm sure you must have missed this lesson. <laughs> Did you do the lesson where we talked about alpha, beta and gamma? Yeah. All right, fine. So this has to be beta because uh, you have 79 protons here. Uh, but it's increased to 80, so to balance it, you must have a minus 1 here. You have it, I'll show you. Yeah, I know. I'm thinking how, like, you know, like minus 1 and 0. Well, what else could it be? It's an alpha. What's alpha? 80 minus 79. Yeah. No, but what's alpha? What's yeah. alpha here? Alpha, what's alpha? What's alpha? <coughs> two protons and two neutrons. So, yeah. what numbers here will be for alpha? 2 and 4, correct? So what's 2 plus 80? 82, which is not yeah. 79. So you have no choice, it must be beta. It's the only way to balance it. And it can't be gamma, because gamma will be 0 and 0. There are no protons and neutrons, so... I thought this, I thought this was an easy question. No? Yeah. <coughs> Should be. Right, how many marks so far do we have? Uh, six, really. Okay. Six in total. <laughs> Continue? What? 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 Okay. Next, we have a graphy question here. We won't do it because we did it. But can you see that you should be getting the 20 out of 20 here? I don't think there's anything different here, is there? How do we complete the table? What's missing here? Log activity. Easy peasy, another two marks. What's our total now? Eight. Plot this for four more marks. Can you do that? Yeah, what's our total now? Uh, Twelve, isn't it? How do we calculate the decay constant? Uh, so the slope. Minus the slope. Two more marks brings us to 14. Half-life is log 2 over the decay constant. Two more marks brings us to 16. Okay. Uh, this one is a calculation where we have to work out the time to get one-third the activity. So this is a bit of a maths one. Remember we did these before. You want one-third of the activity equals A0 E minus lambda T. I'm using the formula A equals A0 E minus lambda T. Yeah. We did ones like this. Yeah. yeah. What do we do here? Cancel. Cancel. Log a third equals minus lambda T. So T will be log a third over minus lambda, yeah, which would be log 3 over lambda. That's two more marks. And lastly, what is the initial number of nuclei for the last two marks? What formula could I use to get that? This is the um, N. So we could use this formula. A equals minus lambda N. Because we know the lambda and we know the A. The A is uh, 9986 kilo. Just be careful with that. Kilo. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> 20 marks. Okay. Let's have a look at another one. Yeah, like really, it always disappoints me when students do badly in the physics exam because I'm thinking, oh goodness, you got 20 marks in the atoms question. If you just found another 20 marks from the other 80 marks in the exam, you've passed, you know. No, I know, but you can understand how disappointed I am when students fail. Because I see no reason to fail this exam. I kind of get why you might fail, like EAP or maths, you know. But when I look at the physics papers, I'm like... Who fails in EAP? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but I don't expect anyone in this class to fail EAP. Not in this class. But, you know, there's some students that have low level of English. So. 
But usually students don't fail the AP. So like, you know, at the end of the year when they pass the AP and fail physics, like, what happened? But there's no, there's no reason to fail the physics. I mean, you can pass the exam nearly on just atoms and some mechanics or whatever. Right, let's have a look at the next version here. Uh, I want to do another atoms question here. No, no. <coughs> Great. Okay. Um, can we do A7? But we'll do it together. But I want you to write the answers down. Uh, so A7. Um, you have a radioactive isotope that releases a beta. What happens to the proton number? Write it down, please. Open up your notebook, come on. This is 2012 version 2, A7. Yeah. Right, so what happens to the proton number when a beta emission takes place? <coughs> it was? Decreases? No, it increases because it's a minus one on the beta. So then, for what's remaining, oh, okay. is increasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, answer for A part one, in an increase. So write that down. It increases by one. Right. Ah, oh, give me strength. Increases by one. What is the effect on the nucleon number? Uh, remains the same. Thank you. Remains the same. It's look, Mir, there was an example earlier. Look, the nucleon stays the same. The proton number increases by one. Now, when you like, explain it, uh, so when it's in like, it describes the effect of beta emission on the proton number, it's like, I think this is the problem. This one's okay though. I'm sorry. It's okay. No, it is. No, but the first question. Yeah, I know. Like, you read the question, you know. <laughs> like, when you see it, you know. Like, oh, it's why it's important to pass this past papers. Right. Um, right, you have an isotope. It's half life 119 seconds, and the activity is 500 kilo. Uh, how long for it to reduce to 125 kilo? So, uh, what's it starting with? 500. Now, quick rough estimate, okay? 500 to 200. Oh, sorry, 500 to 250. How much is that? Oh. That's one half life, isn't it? To go 500 to 250. 250 <coughs> to 125? So the answer is two, two half lives. So that's 238 seconds. Write that down. Did you write that down? Now, it's only one mark, so you know, you should be doing it how I did it. Yeah. You know, snappy, snappy. Uh, right. What formula gives us the second part, which is the N? 238. A equals. Okay, so calculate the N formula, please. Yeah. Oh, one mark, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for one mark. Uh, 500 kilo. Please note, you do not have the decay yeah, constant. Yeah. You'll need to work that out first. But you do have the half life. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, write this down. Try it. Add that. Give it a try. No, no, come on, try it. You got your calculator in your uh, yeah, pencil case. Yeah. Yeah. 
I have my, my topic is electricity. Like what do you think? What's electricity. Yeah. What should I have? Could be interesting. Could yeah. be boring. Okay, I've done it in my presentation. Oh good. I mean, so I have included the... Because Isabel said she weren't ready when she was doing the practice one. I was not there. Exactly. That doesn't mean that I'm not ready. Okay, fair enough. Uh, you were not in a position to do a practice presentation because you were not there, right? Maybe I was practicing at home. Possibly. No, I was, uh, I was at the time. Uh, and were you practicing at home? But no, look, I, I'll tell you. Because in the first semester we had the practice one and in that I did the electricity one. Mm -hmm. So like I just now, you know, just made some few changes. Okay. Do you have an answer now? So this one here, we can use the formula A equals lambda N. So n equals minus a over lambda. But do we have the lambda? No. But what's the formula for lambda? Uh, log 2 over the half light, yeah. So this will be equal to minus the activity times the half life over log 2. Uh, what was the activity at the start? Kilo. The half life? So whatever this is, is the answer. Uh, do I have my calculator? I don't. Can you hit this in, please? <coughs> Good. What did you get? Uh, 10 to the 6. I did the 8.58. 8.58. 10 to the 16 atoms. Okay? This is after I... 10 to the 9? Yeah. Like Where's 10 to the 9? Because yeah, it's a long number. It's a long number. Oh, you converted. Yes, no, no, no. Should I leave it? No, yeah, because you don't really have a unit here because you have atoms. It's not really a unit. So you can't really say mega atoms. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, the only the only suitable thing to convert this into because you're counting atoms will be moles. So you could divide by Avogadro to get the number of moles. But Avogadro is still much bigger than this, right? Yeah. No, we can write like well, it, it will be 1.42 times 10 to the 39. It's better to write. Avogadro? Moles? Yeah. No, you need to divide this by Avogadro, so you're making the numbers smaller. You're making it bigger. You're doing something peculiar there. Divide. So like 10 to the 23? Or yeah. Three? You put brackets around it? It's like this. Okay. Divided. Let's see. No, no. Answer divided. Okay. Answer divided. Well, can I go back to space? Uh, Here, let me just type it in. 8.58 times 10 to the power 16. But and I what? Oh, it's not? Oh, I see. Okay. 500 times 10 to the power of 3 times 119. What's new? Huh? We'll get there, we'll get there. Oh yeah, it's not that big. 86231884 only. Now, what's Avogadro's number, please? 6.02 times 10 to the 23. So this is a top, it's not even worth converting it into Avogadro's number. It's 1.4 times 10 to the minus 16 moles. It's a tiny amount, so it'd be actually more suitable to keep it like that. I would say um, 800 and uh, one, two, three, one, two, three, 86 million atoms. <coughs> yeah. Okay. The last part here is how long for the sample to reduce to 50, and it started off at 500. So what formula am I using there? A equals A0, E minus lambda T. What do I want here? 50 kilo. And what do I have at the beginning? 500 kilo. I don't actually care about the kilos because they cancel. And in fact, 50 goes into 500 10 times. So you get 1 equals 10 e to the minus lambda T. So you get 0 0.1 equals e to the minus lambda T. How do I cancel the E? With a log. So the t would be log 0 0.1 over minus lambda 
Do we know lambda? No. What is lambda? It's log 2 over half-life. So the half-life comes up here. So the answer is log 0 0.1 over log 2 multiplied <coughs> by the half-life. Uh, which, <coughs> what is log 0 0.1 over log 2? Should be like third or something, is it? Log 0 0.1 over log 2 is minus 3.3. Oh, see, I lost a minus here. There's a minus in here. Minus what? 3.3. Three okay, great. So it's minus 3... Uh, it's 3.32 three times 119. 395.3. Yeah? Minus. Uh, the two minuses there. Uh, there was a minus I never wrote in the denominator. Yeah, okay, so second, second? Yeah. Um, I was expecting this to be bigger. Can I have a double check? Log 0 0.1 over log 2. Hmm, okay. If you don't put the brackets after, it's not going to be done. If you don't have brackets? Mm. Yeah, no, it is this. Okay. Something feels a bit fishy here. We start off with 500. No, there's something wrong here. Maybe we'll do it in the lab like the other one. 50 goes into 500 10 times, doesn't it? Yes. And 1 over 10 is 0 0.1, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't matter. We'll look at this when we're doing revision anyway. I can see you're ready to go.